Well, it was a funny thing. It was, I think I gave myself a dare. It was the height of the Cold War. The readers, the young readers, if there was one thing they hated, it was war, it was the military, or as Eisenhower called it, the military industrial complex. So I got a hero who represented that 100th uh, de degree. He was a weapons manufacturer. He was providing weapons for the army. He was rich. He was an industrialist. But he was a good-looking guy, and he was courageous. He went over to Vietnam by himself to test out one of the weapons, and then something happened, and that's how he became Iron Man. But I thought it would be fun to take the kind of character that nobody would like, none of our readers would like, and shove them down their throat and make them like them. And because of the fact that Tony Stark was such a great guy, see, I, I, I kind of had Howard Hughes in mind when I was thinking of Tony Stark. He was a, without being crazy, he was Howard Hughes. Um, and he became very popular. I'll tell you a funny thing about Tony, who, as you know, had a, uh, uh, his heart had been injured, and he was always afraid at any moment he could keel over. I love the concept of a guy in the armored suit and with all the things he could do. And I loved the idea we came up with that Iron Man was really somebody who was Tony Stark's bodyguard because he had to justify what's this guy doing always hanging around. And I thought that was kind of clever. So there was Tony Stark, there was Iron Man occasionally, and oh, he's Tony's bodyguard, that's okay. I love the name Pepper Potts and Happy Hogan. Here's this rich man. He has this beautiful assistant or secretary, and she's in love with him. Now, if I were really an original writer, I would have had her hate him. <laughs> but what the heck? <laughs> of all the comic books we published at Marvel, we got more fan mail for Iron Man from women, from females, than any other title. For some reason, females really loved Iron Man. I figured out it was because, first of all, he was handsome. Secondly, he was rich. And thirdly, I think a girl would want to mother him and say, that's all right, you'll be okay. Don't worry about your heart. I'll look after you. And hey, if you die, I inherit all your money. <laughs> no, I only added that. I didn't mean that. But I, I think there was something about Tony that aroused the maternal instinct in women or something. But whatever the reason, and I, I never got over that, we got more fan mail for Iron Man from girls. We didn't get much fan mail from girls, but whenever we did, it was usually, the letter was usually addressed to Iron Man. The beauty part for me about Iron Man has always been, and here you have this character who on the outside is in, invulnerable. I mean, just can't be touched, but inside is a wounded figure. Stan made it very much a, uh, an in-your-face wound. You know, his, his heart was broken, you know, literally broken. Uh, but there's a metaphor going on there. And that's, that's, I think, what made that character interesting. It was very easy for me to deal with the armor because I didn't have to draw it. I felt sorry for the artist. I'd make, make up anything, add this to the armor, do that to the armor, do that. Then I'd go do something else, and the poor guy had to work on it. And I was never satisfied with Iron Man's armor. If you look through all the issues of Iron Man, you will see, I must have had his armor changed a thousand times. I love, loved Iron Man. It wasn't too much asked of me drawing uh, uh, him because there was hardly a face there. There's just, uh, not even a nose, just a, a slight hint of a nose and a mouth and eyes. We well, never, never even saw the pupils of the eyes. And I loved it because it was a challenge to get to show emotion on his face because he's wearing an, uh, a metal helmet. The suit is all metal. So I, I would bend the, uh, the rules a little bit by showing if he was smiling at something just to tweak the, the mouth up just enough to convey the message to the readers that he's smiling, or anger. And then I would do this, you know, and then you'd see these lines in here. And that would tell them that he was angry. The first cover uh, was in pencil and about the size of a comic book uh, cover. And it sold right away. Um, 
And so I figured since it's the first cover and it was so popular, uh, they even made a print of it, the company. I, um, I decided to recreate it myself. And so I did, and that's how that came into being. That's, of course, much bigger than the, than the cover and more interesting in, in the sense that it's big, it's in color, and that's how I did it. I just copied everything that I had in front of me, all the detail, all the little back figures, and, and the lettering. Um, I did the best I could with it, and it turned out good. Well, it's dynamic, really dynamic, and it moves. That figure moves, and it takes up a good deal of the cover. And of course, the lettering is big. It's like a, a burst. Uh, he's coming out of, a, out of an explosion of some sort. And uh, th these little figures are just trimmings that you can hardly see unless you get up close. It was a joy doing because it was a smooth thing to do. As a kid, I really liked that character uh, precisely because I could imagine myself in that suit. Well, that was fun. When I came onto the Iron Man book, it had been kind of, I won't say floundering, but it had it sort of lost its way for a few uh, years up to that point. It had been a, a, a kind of a stepchild uh, for the Marvel Universe, but it, it, it had always still maintained a certain uh, cachet. I was also very heavily influenced by pop culture, uh, and uh, you know there was, a, there was a lot of characters going around saying they were heavy. That's heavy, man. Heavy. Can you dig it? Uh, these days it would be, what's up, you know? <laughs> Here's a guy who's basically a warmonger, a merchant of death. Now, when the character was created, that was not inherently a bad thing. You know, we're talking about in the early 60s, before Vietnam became a disaster, the idea of, uh, you know, a, a, an arms merchant was not by itself a bad thing. But as time goes on, and the, uh, the war begins to become you know, an issue and something that we as writers cannot ignore, here you have this character who represents the worst aspects of the, you know, the military industrial complex. Now what are you gonna do with that? You, know, you, can do, you, can do, uh, you can take it in many different directions, but one direction that you might wanna take it if you're trying to make a hero is to give him an inner conflict over the fact that he has this uh, place in the world. Well, there are only a handful of villains that, uh, that, that stand out, you know, in the Iron Man's Rogue Gallery. Uh, Crimson Dynamo. Crimson Dynamo uh, the, and uh, the Mandarin, you know, being like the main two. Uh, and both of them sort of iconic uh, Cold War figures, you know. The Red Star, I think, was, was another one. Uh, Black Widow, you know, was I think introduced in Iron Man. So there, were, there was this kind of Cold War uh, uh, demonology going on. You know, all the all the foreigners were bad, and all the, the Americans were good. Well, of all of them, I think the Mandarin, you know, spoke to me the most because he was he was sort of like the anti uh, Stark. Tony is uh, as the richest person in the Marvel universe. Uh, you can almost imagine him as sort of like a like the uh, the linchpin, you know, that draws everybody else together. It was his mansion where the Avengers did the, uh, started the Avengers. I mean, he's the guy who started the Avengers, in effect, by providing them a place to stay. You know, here you are. The Avengers, um, very early on, or reasonably early on, particularly when it came to Cap and, and Thor, uh, these guys learned who was behind the masks or helmets. And that kind of gave Tony a circle of, of peers. Uh, a circle of people that he could relate to on his own level, not necessarily uh, intellectually or scientifically. Shield. I always felt that the uh, that Shield was was a Tony Stark creation in in some sense. That he's the guy who put it together, you know, or made it possible. He certainly must have designed the helicarrier, you know, and probably sold it to them, you know. And Stark Industries was the primary supplier of uh, of weapon technology to the American government, you know, for many years. Tony's involvement in Shield goes right back to the beginning. You read the very first Nick Fury story, Nick Fury Agent of Shield story, and Tony's there. Tony's already part of S.H.I.E.L.D. He's designed all of their tech and stuff and all their advanced weapons and all through the really early issues of, of S.H.I.E.L.D. he kept coming back into the strip. 
um, just as Tony Stark inventor. And every once in a while, they drop maybe a little allusion to Iron Man. But if you weren't reading Iron Man, this was, he was just a guy in, in Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. George Tuska is one of the Aung San heroes. Because his work was, was cartoony, in a, in a, in a sense, uh, at a time when realistic uh, art was, was in demand in, in comics, uh, people didn't take his work as seriously as they probably ought to. He could break a story down uh, as well as any of the best uh, comic book storytellers. And he also drew a very dynamic Iron Man. You know, there was a weight and a solidity to his version of uh, Iron Man that uh, I really liked. It was the first monthly title that I ever did. And that, that happened in that, I think, 77. I think somebody just uh, up and left the company. I was nervous, and it was because uh, my father was working up the office, and it was a monthly title and I hadn't considered ever doing Iron Man when I was up uh, as a young artist. I thought about Spider-Man and, and uh, that type of character, Daredevil. Never thought about doing Iron Man. And it was a different type of a character to me because I always had that problem with the logistics, uh, uh, the armor. Oh my God, it's flexible armor. Uh, I had this close-minded, that's impossible. It's gotta be hinges somewhere, joints. Uh, it didn't make sense. And I, you know, you suspend belief for the character and. Uh, and then I began to really enjoy it. And uh, then it blossomed into more than what it was because it became a melodrama as well as a great visual. And then of course he had his personal problems, the demons, and uh, it became more than the simple, the simplistic armor to save the heart type of character. Okay, this is the very first complete comic I ever did. And I've been told at, uh, the, over the last 30 years that it is the number one book to line bird cages with. Because of this great spot right here, right above, right below the little perch, right there. Getting the first one done was probably as good a feeling as I've ever had in, in anything. Because you, you, it's like climbing your first mountain, you know, hitting your first home run. I was very young, just right out of high school, basically. Probably the youngest guy in the history of Marvel at the time. I mean, there have been younger guys since then. I think I was 19. So getting your foot in the door as a young guy was almost impossible. I mean, Barry Smith had to, like, you know, break down a ton of barriers. He's Barry frickin' Smith, you know? One of the greatest artists in the history of comics, in my opinion, but uh, even for him, it wasn't easy. And that's where I met David Michelini. Dave was always open for immediately for me to be involved in helping create the stories. He, he appreciated what I had to offer, even though I was just the lowly inker. And I started talking to him about Iron Man, you know, which was, from the time I was a kid, this was the character that I wanted to do. I have always been a science buff. So I, with, with Iron Man, it was kind of that way. I, I always said that if you can believe that the suit works, everything else will work. All you gotta do is make the, make the suit look believable. Make it look like it, it functions. And that was really my idea going in, was make the suit look functional. Looking at Iron Man and saying, okay, parts of him are organic, parts of him are not. So I just started inking him that way. In terms of approaching Iron Man, it was always just making it believable to me. I mean, people talk about, you know, that whole Doctor Doom story, the first Camelot thing. I had always argued that Doctor Doom should have been the, the Iron Man villain, not, you know, the Fantastic... I know he's the Fantastic... belongs to the Fantastic Four, but if there ever was a character who was the antithesis of Tony Stark, it was Doctor Doom. They were the same guy on two sides of the coin. He was, I mean, both monarchs, both highly, highly educated, you know, both very sophisticated guys. Never were there two characters meant to, to fight each other in the history of comic books than Doctor Doom and Iron Man. You know, and the fact that they they maintained a mutual respect for each other, even though they hated what the other person stood for. What makes Tony Stark different than everyone else in the Marvel universe, and it's the world that he lives in, that he operates in, the 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 corporate structure, the the world of of high finance, the world of of. Uh, industrial uh, uh, exploration. I mean, the fact that he was a, a scientist who made, made money off what he did. And that's really all we tried to do with that, was we put characters around Tony. Each one of them served a purpose, served a different side of Tony. We'll drop in Jim Rhodes, he's the pilot, and then we'll start delving into his backstory. And he was the guy that, that Tony met when he was you know, in Southeast a East Asia, having just become Iron Man, who helped him get back to the States. You know, Rhodey was that confidant, the guy that he could trust with his life. You know, the guy, that, you know, that had his back. 
all the time, you know. And, and you know, Beth was obviously the person who took care of him emotionally. Here's Tony Stark's day. He comes in, Mrs. Arbogast, Mrs. Arbogast hands him a piece of paper, he signs it. A factory goes up in New Jersey. She comes in, hands him a piece of paper, he signs it, the, a satellite gets built. He, she, another piece of paper, signs it, they close a factory in Guatemala. You know, uh, 10,000 people are out of jobs. He, he uh, designs something, he goes to his drawing board, designs something, it's sent down to the, the technical crew, or whatever, to the technicians. They build it, they do all that kind of stuff, sales and manufacturing, go to it. He never sees the damn thing until it's in orbit. Who could really live that way? It's a different set of problems, a different track, a different things like that. And that, that was one of the things that I thought about with, with Iron Man. This is the only character I think you could really do that with, where you start thinking about alterations in the design to fit specific needs and tasks. And, that, and I, I believe the stealth armor was the first, but you know, we had, Dave and I had already discussed several different options, the space armor and the undersea armor and so forth and so on. I'm going to quote Dave Michelini here, that it was never our intention to do anything relevant. We, we were paid to basically do the next episode of Iron Man. It, just that particular issue, alcoholism was the bad guy. Instead of the Doctor Doom or somebody like that, it was the Bob. That was our villain of the month. And that's really the way we treated it. We built everything up to that, but the point of it is it was never, uh, we never attempted to be relevant. It just, in the corporate world, what gets guys? What causes the downfall? Usually it's greed or it's sex and drugs, right? Well, we couldn't do the sex part, <laughs> right? Alcohol wasn't talked about all that much, really, to be honest with you, and especially with kids, you know, in that particular era. But, you know, we treated it as we intended to, as the bad guy. When we set out doing that extrema story, um, we weren't even certain that it would be a permanent thing because it, on, on one level, it seems like it flies in the face of the concept. And I've certainly heard from, you know, some real hardcore Iron Man fans of days gone by that, no, this isn't Iron Man because Iron Man's, the whole point is he's got a suit of armor. He, he shouldn't have powers built into himself. But I think, you know, two things that it had going for it is one, Warren Ellis is a fantastically talented writer, and two, Warren is Tony Stark. <laughs> Warren is is so far ahead of the curve in terms of reading up on the science. He's so fascinated by the technology and the way it's going to change a society and the way it's going to impact on us individually that he just he just got down to the, the core of it. Tony Stark as sort of, I think the term that, that Warren was sort of tossing around at the time was he's sort of like the test pilot of the future. That he's there, he's the first guy there, and he's going to go out and, and investigate all the possibilities and see what all this stuff does uh, and how it affects him and how it could affect the world. And thus, in, in doing so, sort of beta tested for everybody else. Beyond that, it was beautifully digitally painted or painted by, by Adi. Um, so it had a really sophisticated, sleek, modern look. It was pretty successful, and it got people interested again, and the character started to pop a little bit, and then consequently we went on and did Civil War and did all the stuff that came after that. And right now, you know, the movie notwithstanding, Iron Man is really in, in poised in a position within the Marvel line and within the Marvel Universe where he's, he's like the most important character there is. He's the hub around which everything circles. And it all kind of stem, stepping stone-wise, from the work that Warren and Adi did. Um, so what happened was Joe Casada, the editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics, uh, got talking to me in email one evening about Iron Man, which was a character they were putting new creative teams on once every year or two, and it was never quite working for Joe. This is a character who is a test pilot for the future as his own redemption which is really the thrust behind the extremist graphic novel. Uh, and Joe responded to that take and said, well, off you go then. He was an arms dealer. There's no two ways around it. Um, um, while that is what built his fortune, therefore allowing him to be a technologist, he wasn't actually being that at the genesis of the character. He was just a man who made bombs 
and he's running away from that. The only way he can look himself in the mirror, as far as I'm concerned, is to be Iron Man, is to be uh, that figure of futurism. After I agreed to uh, take a shot at Iron Man for Joe and develop a new take, um, the next thing was finding the artist, and uh, Joe being Joe already had an artist in mind, was Adi Granov. A comics artist um, has a lot of very strange jobs. There's certainly the director, um, to a large extent. Um, cinematography is something that's often shared between the writer and the artist. I created a character uh, called John Pillinger, who is uh, a television journalist, very much based on John Pilger. Um, because in all those years of publication, uh, from what I could find, Tony Stark had very rarely been brought up to account by the real world. So I wanted someone there to lay it out, both for him and the audience. You're an arms dealer, that doesn't mean you just made a couple of bombs. John Pillinger is there to remind him that somewhere in the world right now, someone is dying because of something he's made and he is ne they're never going to let him run away from it. I really wanted to try and ground the character. Um, it's less a superhero graphic novel than it is a science fiction novel. Uh, and that to me required Tony Stark to be a real person. He, he shouldn't be someone who can just put on a costume and fly above his concerns or the concerns of the world. Uh, he's a man who made a moral compromise in his youth. It was simply easier and faster to build a fortune by selling arms than it was uh, to do it pretty much any other way. When I wrote Extremis, uh, I moved the timeline on and I have Stark being struck by shrapnel, uh, not in Vietnam, but in a desert location that could very well be Afghanistan. In Iron Man Extremis, uh, Tony Stark is probably not yet 30, and he's a man passionately interested in bringing on the future, but he doesn't really know what that is yet. Uh, he's very scattered in the book. He's working on 12 things at once, hoping that one of them will be uh, the golden key to, uh, to unlocking a future that uh, he can live with. That's why there are so many of us interested in futurism. We don't know which path is going to break. We don't know which one is going to turn out to be the way through the woods. The character Sal in the book um, was a mentor to Tony and Maya. The thing uh, about Sal in the book that makes him stand apart from both Tony and Maya is that he doesn't have the passion. I think he never really had the passion. I think that's what he admired most uh, in Tony and Maya. He, it wasn't a huge wrench for him to just say the hell with it to everyone. He didn't have uh, the passion and need for redemption that Tony has. I think the germ of the extremist process that I created for the graphic novel was reading somewhere a long time ago that the human brain uh, retains a template of what the body should look like. And it refers to that when repairing wounds. And it simply struck me that if that could be hacked, then you could make the body do all kinds of interesting things. Two, uh, some years later, a suit that he could fold up and carry in a briefcase. Two, as you see at the start of the graphic novel, something that has to be shipped in a crate or hangs on chains in his garage. Uh, very much going back to the tank model. Which made a little sense in terms of the standard process of technological development which is to make things smaller and more effective at the same time. So attacking it from that aspect and constantly keeping the title of a thing in mind, it seemed to me to only make sense if he was wearing the Iron Man suit, if you like, at all times, that he became an Iron Man, that a large 
amount of the suit itself was stored inside his body um, using uh, I mean, what you presume is some kind of nanotechnological process. Uh, so it actually fulfills physical functions as well as laying there and potential inside his body. So yeah, the, the, the Iron Man suit is mostly contained inside his bones. Well, with Extremis, it was my job uh, to reboot the character, to, to reinvent the character and present new situations and conflicts for him, which I think the book did. I think probably the, the favorite part in Extremis for me is in second issue when Malin walks into the FBI building and uh, I think that's where I really hit my stride as a storyteller. Uh, I think that's when I started feeling comfortable with just telling uh, or choreographing scenes and uh, I think the action in it came out quite good. Uh, the way I approached the design of the suit in Extremis particularly is I kind of uh, try to add realism to, to, to my art so it, it looks like something could actually you know with suspension of disbelief actually function. Before our book the suit was actually always in a briefcase but then we thought when we did Extremis that how can you fit this giant suit into a briefcase it just makes no sense so it was outside of a briefcase it was actually in a giant crate that would be shipped wherever he needed it but then when he actually injects himself, then he uses this new suit, which is much smaller. And it, um, then I started thinking about um, memory metals, you know, so it can be folded. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that I really think about. Uh, so memory metals, so you could fold the suit and fit it in a suitcase. And then because he had some kind of power, uh, magnetic powers he could actually like maneuver the suit around them to actually then like fit onto him. Well basically first time Warren Ellis and I met it was I think right I was working on whichever the issue came before that I think it was issue number three and I was telling him how much I like the original gray Iron Man armor because it's just a, a clunky tank type of a thing and a few weeks later, I get the script and he's written that scene into it because, and he, this is what he said, uh, that, that he wrote it because I, I like the, uh, that suit so much. I am an illustrator before anything else and I, I try to come up with uh, striking images, at least in my opinion, I, and I try to compose images that will tell a story in a certain way. And uh, when it comes to doing sequential art, to comic book pages, I try to serve the story uh, before creating beautiful images. But I try to create beautiful images at the same time, if that makes sense. Iron Man in Civil War. I mean, ultimately, Civil War is a story about Captain America and Iron Man. And to a lesser degree, about Spider-Man as sort of the third lower point on that, that triangle. Um, and it was that from, from the very beginning, as the story started to crystallize and the basic themes of, of freedom versus security kind of played themselves out, those two characters, because they're so central to the mythos of Marvel and they're both so central to the Avengers and the superhuman community, this is a character who'll do whatever needs to be done and take the weight on himself. That seemed to be a pretty interesting place to put him in, in Civil War, and to some degree, a surprising place because again the, the, the knee jerk is Cap will be the guy that toes the line and Iron Man will, will not. Um, as the story played out and as we figured it out you know we got to the end where ultimately it's got to be the pro registration side that comes out on top and somewhere along the line there one of us had the notion of okay where's that going to leave us let's let's put Tony in charge of, of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, that puts him in another interesting place. It's like running a company, but completely different because it's a worldwide peacekeeping force. It's more military oriented, but a lot of the same skills that he brings to running a company uh, on an economic level can be can be played out against this this larger scale thing. Tony became more and more the center point even beyond Civil War. All the stuff that we went after that because he was the guy in charge. He was the man with the plan and the guy with the vision and the guy that ac across the course of doing these uh, these things, putting these plans into place and running into conflict with guys that, that were his friends, you know, did things that he knew were, 
were tough. Tony Stark is a very difficult character to write because he's a lot smarter than any writer who's ever going to tackle him. Uh, none of us can claim to know how to create anything technical. <laughs> you know, we're totally faking it. Um, he's also a much more sophisticated character. His lifestyle, his, you know, background. I don't know any comic book writers that are trust fund babies that really know that side of society. Or I mean, it's all, it's all got to come out of our heads, you know. It's, he's a tough character to write in that sense. Um, but it's also a lot of fun. The Inevitable came out of uh, the relaunch that uh, Warren Ellis and Adi Granoff did, uh, which was a great relaunch, but they weren't using any of his villains. They weren't using any of his rogues gallery. And Iron Man has a great rogues gallery. And those villains specifically, I, I, if I could have jammed more villains into that story, I would have. But, I, you know, three seemed to be the limit. But I loved those characters. Iron Man has this very specific kind of rogues gallery. They're also technologically based. Um, <clears throat> whether it's the living laser from, uh, or the ghost with his stealth suit or spy master who's sort of the, uh, the industrial espionage side of, of an Iron Man story that's also very interesting to me. So I wanted to bring back those characters for a modern audience. The way I tell these stories whenever I'm doing a, a sort of historical tale is I always, in my mind, set them in the present. Write them as though they're happening right now. Um, there, there's a rule of thumb with comic books. It doesn't matter when it came out, whenever you're reading it, it's happening right now. It's why comics are written in the present tense. Uh, narrative captions, you know, are written in the present tense because when you're reading a comic, the idea is it's happening right now. So my feeling was the Mandarin is Iron Man's quintessential enemy, his opposite number, magic versus, you know, mechanical. Uh, technology versus mysticism. It's a great opposite number pairing. Um, but their first uh, encounters didn't have a lot of mythic power. They were sort of one in a series of stories that were being told at the time. I don't think anyone knew that the Mandarin would grow into uh, Iron Man's quintessential foe. Eric Canetti I've known him for years. We worked together in comics uh, a couple times when he was first breaking in and uh, always loved his work, but it was so technically precise and it was kind of a Jeff Darrow kind of thing going on. I just thought, man, you know, this, is, this guy is made to draw Iron Man. What I didn't expect, what he did inject with the work is this life, this movement that comes from his years in animation. At the moment, uh, Dan and Charlie Knopf are writing Iron Man. Dan was the creator of Carnival, the television series, and does a lot of writing there. And Charlie is his son, uh, young and up and coming screenwriter and comic book writer. Um, they sort of picked up the baton from where uh, Warren had left it and have carried it forward, doing all of the Civil War connectivity stuff and all of the Iron Man director of S.H.I.E.L.D. arc and, and all of this sort of thing. Yeah, the NOS really brought in a very real-world espionage kind of flavor to Iron Man, which I think was really fantastic, and, and, and a real real world sort of tech. I mean, it, it definitely definitely feel the weight of the world on, on Tony Stark and, and on the Marvel Universe within their story. So they've just done a great job of it. I mean, they, they really are writing it like a TV show. When I was doing Carnival, I actually turned on a, some of my staff to graphic novels. I said, I want you to read these to sort of get a sense of the type of storytelling. And after Carnival um, ran its course, I got a call from, uh, I actually wasn't even a friend of mine, who said, hey, I was talking to a guy, he's at Marvel, they really want you to do a comic book. And I talked to them and they they said, yeah, you know, um, we'd, we'd love for you to do it. It's funny because he, he they, they offer him this thing and um, he calls me up, and I know this because he calls me up on April 1st. 
And, um, you know, I've been reading comic books since I was a kid. And he calls me up on April 1st. He goes, hey, hey, Charlie, are you interested in, in, in doing a comic book with me for Marvel? And I go, no, shut the F up, man. This is, <laughs> this is a joke. Why, why are you messing with me like this, you know? Yeah, it would be He goes, typical. no, no, I know. This would be typical him. And, <laughs> and he goes, no, no, I am, I am serious. And, yeah. you know, after I changed my pants, I, uh, I called him back. And, and, and um, we sat down and we discussed. And what was the criteria? You said no. No, I want to do a character. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, they, they said, we want, do you want to do one of our characters? And I yeah. said, well, you know, I'd really like to do one of your characters that's not, that's underperforming. Yeah. I, I'd really like you to find me a character that's underperforming, and I, I'd like one that's a little bit morally ambivalent. And, well, he said, well, how about, you know, the, which one would you, I said, well, my first choice would be Iron Man. I thought, well, they won't give me Iron Man. And then he called me and said, yeah, we'd love you to do Iron Man. And I said, well, okay, if, if I'm going to do it, I have to do it with my, my son because I'm so out of touch with superhero books. Um, and and uh, he knows the, 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 the idiom inside out. And I also knew that I had my plate full with television and film projects. I knew Charlie was talented. It was a little bit of a leap. It was a little scary. Um, I knew I had the craft to help him with his scene work. And I knew he knew the ins and outs. And what you can and can't yeah. do with a comic book. So he does all the first drafts. Yeah. So he carries he carries sort of the, you know, he does the heavy lifting, which is looking at a blank page. And then uh, we break story together. We'll, yeah. we'll break story, then he'll do the first draft. Then I'll sit down and we'll sit at the typewriter and, and, and work together. And when I'm making changes, he's learning bits and pieces of, of craft that it, I kind of more or less had to learn by myself. Yeah. It was sort of nerve wracking um, because I thought, what if he has no talent? What what if yeah what what yeah. if what if he can't do it? And then how do I deal with that? And I certainly didn't want to be sitting there and carrying him. Now I had the advantage of having worked with my father at one time in a very different business, but I understood the psychological aspects of it. So I'd I'd tread that minefield before. So I knew. You know, I knew I, I know where there's warning signs, you know, um, and but no, he was able to pick it up right away. You can't teach talent. That's the only thing you can't teach. When we came in, we just want to write a kick ass book. Yeah. We want to write a book uh, that 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 works. But I think when we came in with it would be the height of hubris. I mean, look, Warren Ellis is a master. Uh, I'm not going to follow Warren Ellis. And in, in, I mean, it's like everything he gave us in Extremis was a gift execute program you could see the curve as we were moving through it like you know the earlier issues when we got to the later issues we're going mm -hmm. you know <laughs> um they said just finish your story you're going to be well into civil war by the time you finish and so we kept track of what was going on with civil war and we really saw tony as being lincoln-esque we were sort of when we looked at registration as an issue if it was real Absolutely. And really, again, I think the, the idea is, is is that we saw him as almost like Abraham Lincoln, that he, yeah. he's, he's, he's behind a, a cause that's costing lives, that's unpopular, that's costing friendships, um, but he sticks to his guns. From what I understand from talking to artists, um, it's, it's difficult to um, have expressions with a lot of these superheroes, especially with Iron Man. He's got this big iron mask on. Yeah, we always go going close to the eye slit. Yeah, what we really like about both Patrick and Rob is that their expressions are so good. Now, granted, you know, with Iron Man, we have to get in close, like you said, getting close to the iron slit. Rob had this great scene in one of our issues where Maria looks up and, and, and she says, where, what's your ETA? And he goes right freaking now and flies over Maria and he's got this great shot of her looking up and her eyes or what the hell's going on. <laughs> um, I think that's really important. What I like about um, Iron Man and Tony Stark, what really works for me, I mean, actually when I'm drawing Iron Man, I enjoy drawing the Tony Stark scenes more than I do the Iron Man ones. So many of Marvel's characters are um, radiated and, and become a, a monster or um, bit by a spider or um, cosmic rays. And Iron Man was... Um, I mean, I don't know if you can say you identify if a guy who's a, a handsome billionaire who gets all the ladies, but he was still a, a, a real guy, and he's a self-made superhero. He's a superhero because he wants to be, um, because he, he uh, he's the engineer as a superhero. You know, he's superhero by design. You know, I mean, I, that, that's unique. You know, I love that. The double-edged sort of drawing Iron Man was, on the one hand, you had these, these um, 
supporting characters in Tony Stark who were very emotive and going through extreme emotional strain. And on the other hand, you had to draw a guy with a faceplate who, whose emotions were, were hidden beneath the armor. I mean, I, I enjoy the emotional aspects of it. You know, with Maya and Sal, uh, I thought the Noffs did a wonderful job with those characters. Some of my favorite scenes were what they were, what was going on with them. Um, and um, I don't know if Daniel was ever aware of this, but from some pictures online I saw, I saw of him, I started to base uh, my drawings of Sal off of how he actually looked. Uh, I mean, I, mean, I actually think maybe Daniel might be even more extreme looking. I think he, I think the picture I saw had a he had a beret and, and some braids in his beard, but but definitely there was a, a bohemian uh, approach uh, to Sal that I picked up on from from just uh, what I knew about Dan. When you're doing something like Iron Man's armor and you have to draw sideways, front, back, forward, um, in comics you draw every conceivable angle. Not having that full field of information. Um, will actually, by accident, will bring about a style of your own. Fortunately, there, there are enough people out there still that, um, that just love the beauty of like a, a line approach, you know, um, as opposed to photorealism. Color-wise, I, I was really looking for more of a pastel look um, so that the, the, the openness and the simple lines would come out more. When I was first offered the assignment, um, I was actually out on vacation with my family and um, my uh, editor called on the cell phone and said, um, you know, how would you like to do Iron Man? And, um, you know, you, right away I, I want to scream, are you kidding? Yeah, of course. And um, she told me that the Knopfs would be writing it and uh, that they had done Carnival for HBO. And uh, it, it just got better and better as far as I was concerned. Um, to me, the, um, great comics start with great stories. And uh, these guys, um, I knew were, gonna, were going to write great stories. When I think about the project, I remember there was an awful lot of research about actual places. They say London, they don't just say London, um, it's Piccadilly Circle, it's, um, there's a library, a specific library I had to draw a research scene in. Um, there were a lot of places like that where they used um, exact locations. So you ready to go? Mm -hmm. uh, this is my daughter Genevieve and she wanted to get on this uh, DVD too, so she, uh, she did a drawing of Iron Man. As you can see, um, the, the Cuberts and the Ramitas have uh, something to look out for here. I think it's pretty impressive myself. What do you think? Uh huh. I think it's good too. <laughs> Great. So, Jenny, <laughs> how, how old are you? Um, I'm eight. And how long did it take you to do this? Um. You spent a couple of hours say, on it last night. Yeah, a couple of hours, pretty much. She came in and said, "I want to draw something." And I said, "Well, why don't you draw one of the characters that Daddy draws?" Then I said, yes. Yeah, so. "Yes." Yes. Do you like Iron Man? Yeah, he's cool. I've just written uh, a serial called Ultimate Human, and this is a whole other kettle of worms entirely, because it's what they call the ultimate version of Tony Stark. And the idea was that the ultimate books would represent all these old characters as if they were new once again, to introduce an entirely new generation to, to the properties. Um, one of whom, of course, is Tony Stark, Iron Man. And Ultimate Human uh, presents what I refer to as Ultimate Iron Man and Ultimate Hulk. These two characters have been re-envisioned for this new line of books, so I found myself writing Tony Stark again. Uh, the Tony Stark of the Marvel Ultimate line is a cheerful drunk uh, who has a brain tumour the size of a golf ball, uh, oddly enough. Um, smells of chemotherapy drugs. Uh, needs a team of at least eight people to load him into his Iron Man suit. <laughs> it's uh, a very different take on the character. It wasn't mine. That Iron Man was developed by a writer called Mark Miller. Uh, an ultimate human, as I say, uh, presents these two characters together. In that universe, uh, their, their Bruce Banner, their Hulk, is someone who became the Hulk after taking a flawed chemical process that would make him superhuman. Whereas their Tony Stark um, is a, a full bore futurist. This is a man who plans 10 years into the future. Uh, and the Iron Man 
suit is very much part of a, a, a grander game, a, a broader plan than anyone really knows uh, the extent of. So they both, uh, they both, they both come from the intent of developing superhuman abilities, and they've both, in their own ways, gone horribly wrong. What is it about Iron Man? He's a character that uh, can be reinterpreted for each new generation in a way that more iconic characters can't. I think what makes what makes Tony Stark so interesting to me is that the, I, I happen to really love conflicted characters. I love characters that that have sort of a you know a dark edge to them. That that they they sort of walk that line. Uh, that if they step one you know go a little bit to the left, they may be in the dark or in the light. Uh, and, and that really appeals to me. And and the fact that he, he's just so smart and so Machiavellian and not unlike myself actually. Uh, <laughs> That, uh, that that really attracts me to the character. He's not just a, a cookie cutter, you know, superhero or hero. Um, he's a guy with you know with a bit of a past and uh, and a bit of, a, of an edge to him. Iron Man is a very conscious superhero. His creation was uh, very conscious. He had to do it, you know. Uh, and it's it's a conscious choice to continue to be Iron Man. I mean, if you, the, I'm talking about just the original premise of he has the heart problem, he needs to wear the chest plate. He couldn't come back from that captivity and simply worn the chest piece, gone on as Tony Stark and just gone on with his life. But he made a conscious choice to keep going as Iron Man. He saw some kind of uh, greater good and continuing on with that. It wasn't about the armor, it was about the guy inside. And that was always what the stories were about, the guy inside. 